For all of you watching on PBS and around the globe, a warm welcome to BBC World News. We start in Ukraine, where officials say a critical infrastructure facility near the capital, Kyiv, has been hit by Russian strikes. Ukrainian media reported at least three explosions. There's no information on casualties. There's also been shelling in the southern city of Mykolaiv. Meanwhile, at the United Nations in New York, in a symbolic vote, around three-quarters of the General Assembly nations voted to condemn what was described as Russia's attempted illegal annexation of four partially occupied regions in Ukraine. The motion, which isn't internationally binding, also called on all countries not to recognize the annexation. This is the way the vote was tallied. Of the 193 General Assembly members, 143 voted to condemn Russia. 35 abstained and five, including Russia and Belarus, voted against. Let's uh, go live to Ukraine now and talk to Hugo Bashega, who's there for us in Kyiv. And Hugo, tell us about the latest strikes on Ukraine. Yeah, Carrie, let me start with uh, what happened here in uh, the region of Kyiv. Uh, the governor said a village was hit uh, in the early hours of the morning. He said this uh, attack was caused by a so-called kamikaze drone, which is a drone that has been provided by the Russians to uh, the uh, by the Iranians to the Russians and Russian forces have been using those drones to target uh, places across the country. And in the city of Mikolaev, uh, in the south of the country, uh, officials say one person was killed after a residential area of the city was hit by Russian shelling overnight. Uh, the mayor uh, said the rescue efforts are still under way. Uh, six people are still uh, missing after this attack. Uh, Mikolaev has been frequently targeted by Russian forces. It is relatively close to the front lines in the south of the country. Now, the Ukrainians have been saying that this is how Russia is reacting to its recent uh, military defeats by attacking civilian sites and civilian infrastructure across the country. But as we talk about the recent uh, military developments here in this country, I think uh, we all remember the siege of the Azovstal steelworks in the city of Mariupol. Hundreds of Ukrainian fighters were taken uh, as prisoners of war by Russia, and many here believe that they will never be released. So it was a major surprise when a prisoner swap happened last month, and top members of the Azov regiment uh, from Mariupol were released. Uh, they were called, described as uh, neo-Nazis, as terrorists in Russia, and many were defending harsh penalties, including the execution of those uh, prisoners. Uh, some of them are now here in Kyiv, and I've been speaking to with uh, Ilya Somailenko, one of the key Azov fighters who have been released, and he's been telling me about the destruction in Mariupol. They've been destroying civilian uh, blocks. We've seen this with our own eyes, and uh, we were like, it's, 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 hard, it's, it's hard to understand why they are doing this. We were just doing our job, and we were trying to make it as best as possible. Uh, we, were, we, we had nowhere to retreat because we were encircled. Thousands of our comrades, battle brothers, they are still captured. Uh, we should not uh, ask the people who, who returned from, the, from, the, um, from being captured who returned back um, about the details, yeah, because the details, well, this is obvious things, yeah, obvious things that people who are captured, uh, that they are tortured by the Russians. Oh, I just, I just been in solitude for four months in mm -hmm. uh, like relatively normal conditions. I knew this from the guys in Alenivka, that uh, with, e with, with each new week their conditions became worse, worse and worse. You just can, you know, uh, find some videos on, uh, on the web uh, about the conditions of in, in Russian prison, just for the regular prisoners, yeah. And uh, multiply this by two, and this will be like the conditions in the Russian uh, prison camp for prisoners of war. They don't give a care about the rules of war. Uh, they don't give a care about the Geneva Committee uh, statements. Uh, they don't give a care about the lives of the people, yeah. Most people thought that it would never be released. Did you did you think that you could could be released? When I was captured, I uh, it was a very big chance for us to to stay in Russia and never came back. It's it, it was extremely huge. So it, so you prepared for that? Yeah, we were prepared. Was there any moment that you just sort of you know you had lost hope that you would be released and returned to Ukraine? Uh, 
you should never lost your hope, but uh, e the hope should not obstruct your vision and uh, perception of reality. Uh, How has it well, been with the family for the first time? Uh, it was, well, like, uh, after all this time, it's happy to see, like, my beloved ones. It's happy to see my friends. It's happy to see the people who've been waiting for me. But uh, it's a bittersweet moment because I know that uh, hundreds of families still waiting for, the, for their warriors. Uh, the Russians still torturing them, still, still keeping their keeping them in the inhumane conditions, and that's that's why it's, it's our top priority right now. It's to restore the, restore ourselves to return to the battlefield, and we we have to return as a solid unit because we have to take our boys back. So that's uh, Ilya Somailenko, uh, who was one of the uh, Azov fighters released in this prisoner exchange. And Karin, this was a, a source of uh, celebration here because nobody really thought that these uh, fighters would ever be seen again here in Ukraine. Incredible series of events watching what happened there. Um, Hugo, while we have you, we're just looking at pictures from Strasbourg uh, where the uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg is being addressed live by the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who we can see here talking via video link from Kyiv. Now, I'm just told we do have translation of what, he was, what he's going to be saying. Let's just, just listen in briefly. Eight years of war in Donbass. I think you are well informed about what Ukrainians have to live through these days because in the European media there is no shortage of information about specific manifestations of the Russian terror and about the course of this war. The Ukrainian delegation at the Parliamentary Assembly is working quite effectively stressing what is important for Ukraine and for all of Europe. So I won't take your time to tell you about the new targets of the Russian terrorists and the events at the front line. I want to focus on something else, on how and when we will be able to put an end to these days. When the war will end, when peace will come, when our territorial integrity, peace and quiet will come back to the Ukrainian land. I remember when I became president of Ukraine in 2019, our country had quite difficult relations with the Council of Europe, because then the Russian delegation had come to the Parliamentary Assembly. In fact, it was an attempt to forget everything that Russia had done against Ukraine and European values starting with 2014, forget it by covering it with the ideas that allegedly one had to keep up the dialogue with Russia on all possible levels. Then the word dialogue, camouflage, the desire to just ignore the reality. And even worse, that word camouflage, the desire of some actors to get a part of the corrupt money flow from Russia to Europe that had already caused many troubles in the European politics. This year there is nothing like that any longer, and I'm really grateful to you for that, really grateful. When Russia started, it's Well, there we are, President Zelensky, invasion. as he does so frequently addressing parliaments and organizations around the world. The Council of Europe is an international organization founded after World War II to uphold human rights, democracy and the rule of law in Europe. Uh, Hugo is still with us. And Hugo, I mean, we hear from President Zelensky very regularly, but given what has happened in Ukraine over recent days, given Russia's actions, so many Ukrainian cities targeted, uh, what is his message likely to be this time? Yeah, I think the president has been very clear that what the Ukrainians need is uh, air defense uh, capabilities. They think that this is the kind of technology they need to protect cities and uh, towns across the country from the threat of Russian uh, missiles. And I, I think uh, he's been saying that what happened on Monday is uh, proof that the Ukrainians need to be provided with this kind of technology. And uh, after those attacks on Monday, uh, President Biden 
Biden said that the United States would provide the Ukrainians with this kind of technology. Germany uh, has delivered uh, some of uh, some equipment uh, for that to happen. And today we had an announcement from the British Defense Secretary saying that the UK would give air defense missiles to Ukraine and those rockets would be able to uh, destroy cruise missiles. So I think this is the kind of message that the Ukrainians have been sending to uh, Western countries that they need this kind of equipment and technology to protect uh, cities from uh, the threat posed by uh, Russian missiles. Hugo, thank you very much. Hugo Bashega, thanks for staying with us, Hugo, for that uh, hearing from President Zelensky. Now, let's stay on this theme because NATO defence ministers are meeting in Brussels for a second day to discuss their ongoing response to the war in Ukraine. At the head of the table, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg and the US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin. They spoke to the media, media on their way in to the gathering. We will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. We will step up our support uh, and in particular we will provide more uh, air defense uh, systems uh, to uh, Ukraine. I want to applaud uh, all of uh, our allies and partners who have stepped up to, uh, to provide uh, assistance to, uh, to Ukraine. You, you know, Russia is in this eighth month of its unprovoked and unjust invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and since, uh, since uh, it uh, it's done that. Allies have uh, continued to step up to provide uh, security assistance. Well, let's uh, talk to Jessica Parker, our correspondent, who joins us live from Brussels. And Jess, uh, the NATO's solidarity with Ukraine continues as ever. But what has been announced by way of help that is tangible and new? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, Hugo was just outlining some of what we've heard over the past few days, including a pledge overnight from the UK for AMRAM rockets capable of shooting down cruise missiles. Uh, the UK government, though, hasn't said how many of these uh, they would send. They're pretty expensive bits of kit described as cutting edge by the government. They're saying those will be delivered within the coming weeks. So it's not an exact timeline. But what's interesting is they are due to be paired with some air defence systems that the United States is going to be sending. And the US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin was asked about when those air defence systems are going to be delivered to Ukraine last night by quite an emotional Ukrainian journalist who was saying that his family couldn't sleep at night. He'd been in Kiev earlier in the week when, of course, uh, Russia decided to go ahead with missile attacks. And Lloyd Austin's response was that they would get those systems to Ukraine as soon as possible. And I think when you hear these pledges of support, whether it's from the Netherlands, whether it's from Germany, the United States, or the UK, there's always this question of when will these weapons actually arrive? And one of the things that uh, defence ministers are talking about last night into today is also around procurement because countries have been supplying weapons to Ukraine, they've also found that their own stocks have been depleted. And actually, we've seen this morning an announcement that 13 NATO allies have signed a letter around an intent for joint procurement on air defence systems. Just briefly, uh, very interesting to hear what Lloyd Austin said as he was going in. Something else he said was every inch of NATO territory will be defended if it comes to it under Article 5 obligations. I imagine that's designed to send a message to President Putin, but also, I'd imagine, to, to reassure those NATO member states who border Russia and right now feel particularly vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, worth pointing out, um, many people will know this, but of course, Ukraine isn't in NATO, but there are 30 countries that are, and they include some of those countries on that eastern flank, which they've been reinforcing in terms of uh, presence there. Uh, and I think you're right, that it absolutely is designed to, to send a message. Uh, there's messages kind of coming out of this summit that are about solidarity for Ukraine, but also as well, you're right, saying that they will protect every inch of NATO territory. So I think those messages will keep coming from Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General, who we should hear from again uh, later today. But the other thing that they've been talking about, it's not just about uh, protecting sort of land territory, but critical infrastructure as well, following, for example, the suspected sabotage of those Nord Stream gas pipelines. So they're looking at protecting territory, but also those vital pieces of infrastructure that keep the West running. Yes, thanks very much. Jessica Parker there at the NATO meeting in Brussels.
Well, President Putin arrived in Kazakhstan earlier for a regional summit there. And what are expected to be a series of one-to-one -one meetings, the gathering is known as the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia. Among the leaders expected to have some one-to-one -one time with President Putin, Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who, according to the Kremlin, will raise ideas for peace in Ukraine. There is so much more about uh, the war in Ukraine on the BBC website. There's a special section looking at all the developments, comments from all of the main figures. It's fact-checked, it's analysed by experts, bbc.com news, or you can access all of that too via the BBC News app.